first let's pick up where I left off last time. So we're still talking difference. And I, I talked about how this whole idea of, you know, convergence uh, from regional cultures and no one national culture, how that's nonsense because we can't even agree on what to call soda, even though it's so obviously you call it soda and not pop. Um, so we talked about that. Now we're going to get into advertising, which I think it's it's uh, uh, what's fascinating, really, because if you think of the bazillions of dollars spent on this stuff, um, it's a lot of people like to say, like, Whoa, advertising, it doesn't work. Uh, me, I'm my own man. I'm going to buy what I want to buy and not what they're telling me to buy. I, I, I don't even bother saying that anymore. I know I'm a, a rube when it comes to this stuff. And we all are. And there's, there's a lot going on here. So it's good to study marketing, advertising, commercials, print ads, things that pop up on the web, you know, and all of, of that. And also, it's always good to think about the spatial nature of these things. How is place used, for example, um, in these these marketing campaigns. So I'm going to talk about that. And we're going to get into the fact that the difference and sense of place is used quite heavily, okay? So we, we think about in terms of, you know, like the convergence hypothesis and stuff we buy and all that. We tend to think about the fact that, uh, um, you know, everything is the same and we all buy the same stuff, blah, 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 same, you know, kind of national pop culture uh, deal. But no, it's not, difference is still, it's played up, right? So it may be the case that there's a lot of sameness out there uh, in authenticity, like whatever you want to think about um, as you're studying this stuff. But still, the idea of difference the idea of sense of place, that's used heavily to try to get us to buy stuff, right? To make us feel like we are, in fact, individuals. And there are different things out there, and, you know, to connect in that way. So here, here are two examples. Uh, we got this first ad right here. Look at that. Whoa, so cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a sucker for a good Jeep ad. So you, you've got the, the Wrangler driving over these these boulders out in the forest and the text says when's the last time you got goosebumps traveling at three miles per hour yeah right and so and so the idea is if you're doing like real jeep and if you're really doing some four wheeling here you're going to be moving slowly as you're driving over these boulders but what it's getting at is like you, you see the trees it's um Kind of a stark thing. The black and white is kind of exciting in that way, but it's also got this beautiful nature view going on. But it's it's showing you that it's driving in a place where normal vehicles cannot drive, right? And saying like you you get this Jeep, you get to go to this place, and you get to drive. And yeah, you're gonna be driving slowly, but it's gonna be so exciting because it's such a different thing. You're gonna love it. And so if you look at that and you go like, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, I want that. I, I want to get goosebumps and all that. What you're looking at is you're saying, yeah, I want that sense of place. I want to somehow get a hold of this idea of some trail out in the forest that only my Jeep can drive over, right? That's what I'm going for here. But then you look at this car ad, totally different vibe, right here, a Lexus, uh, and so you've got that, we're in an urban area, you can see the palm trees in the background, so it's LA, or it's Miami, or it's something along those lines, uh, and you've got, so you've got the car, sexy car, you've got the sexy people right there, right, the guy, the gal, they're going, I don't know, to a restaurant, to a club, you, kinda, you can kind of see into this behind the glass, into where they're trying to go to, but the whole thing, it's just sexy, 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 right? And the the text up there, arrive fashionably, period, never late, right? You're not fashionably late. You show up looking good, and I guess it's not late because the party doesn't 
start until you're there, maybe? Or maybe it's saying that because it's so fast and zippy, um, you're there on time? I don't know. Um, but it's the idea that this is selling a totally different sense of place, right? To, to If you swap them, well, A, you know, if we go back here, the idea of actually putting a Lexus on there, that would, would, would be fun. Um, but yeah, well, Lexus couldn't drive on that. That's for Jeeps. Uh, and here, nobody's going to pull up uh, in some, you know, Jeep with its top off and all that when you're going for this level of urban cool, right? Totally different things. But when you think about it, like it's, it's playing this stuff up. But if you buy a Jeep, or you buy a Lexus, is this really what you're doing? Are you really getting into that sense of place? Like, we, we go back here. How I many Jeep owners do you think? I don't have the, the numbers out there, but you see them all over. Like, all over the AV, you see Jeeps all the time. Um, you know, in varying ages and, and um, you know, accoutrement on there and, and all of that. But how many of those Jeeps, honestly, do you think you've ever driven over rocks like this? I mean, really? Come on. And you, you can look. You can see some of them. Like, yeah, 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 that one's been on rocks. But a lot of the other ones? Uh, no. No. Like, the, the roughest, the most extreme they uh, they do is, you know, that, that rough section of, of 30th Street West or, or whatever. It's a little bumpy um, in this area. Maybe they, they part uh, in the dirt when it's time for the fair. Uh, or whatever. But honestly, you buy the Jeep, but you've also, you spent like, if you're getting a good one, if you're getting one that could actually, you know, do this kind of stuff, which they don't, you know, really tell you. Little, simple things, like this little rocker panel right there, that doesn't come standard on Jeeps. You gotta do stuff uh, to your Jeep to actually make it be able to get through here and not die. So let's say you buy the Rubicon Edition, you, you do that, you're spending like $50,000 on a Jeep, right? Which is like, which is like a Lexus uh, money, but if you drop fifty thousand dollars on that Jeep, uh, do you really want to take it down to the woods to beat the hell out of it? You know, probably not. You're going to be careful. So you're you're not you're not buying it, right? To necessarily be able to do this, but you're you're trying to get something, some connection to that sense of place. Now we go here, right? Uh, Lexus, um, pretty much the same cost. I don't know how much this model is, but you could you could easily spend fifty thousand dollars on a really nice Lexus, right? Same kind of vibe, but it's kind of the same thing. Like if you buy that Lexus, are you you going into all these these hip happening places? Probably not if you have one here in the Antelope Valley, right? Because we don't have hip happening places like like you don't have the same vibe vibe, right? When you you pull up to Olive Garden in your Lexus, you know, dressed like this and all that. I mean, maybe you do, bless your heart. Um, yeah, but, but it's not the same kind of deal. And and that said, too, like, I look at this. This is work, right, to, to, to really achieve this. Like, if I'm buying a Lexus, I don't, I don't really want this, right, because this is, this is ever, like, look at this guy. Look at, look at this guy right here. Don't ignore the woman there. Um, I mean, you know, very beautiful, clearly and fit to the but I'm just, I'm looking at the guy right there who clearly, this guy probably does sit-ups. I ain't got time for sit-ups. Look at that. And he's wearing his, like his pants and his jacket match and he's got shiny shoes. And, oh, look at that full head of hair, but it's like the gray, you know, it's like that distinguished older gentleman, but still looks fantastic. I ain't got hair like that. Oh, I like just to to do that and to even go to places like this or to even want to like you know what i'm going to move to miami um and and do the whole you know club scene and all that. that's exhausting exhausting i don't want to have to do what these people have to do to look this way to maintain this lifestyle and all that but if i buy a lexus well maybe i can get a hold of that idea, get a little piece of that sense of place without actually having to move forward and try to actually do it, right? So it's not when you're you're marketing stuff, what, the, what these people are trying to do is they're trying to get you to buy the stuff, clearly, but they're not trying to get you to buy it so that you can then do whatever it is they're selling. They're, they're selling you the idea, right? But, but not the reality, if that makes sense. And, and a great 
example of this uh, is with the Marlboro Man. And this is, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a damn shame. And this is, yet again, one of those times where I wish I could be in a classroom with you guys and, and look into your eyes and talk to you about how cool smoking used to be. Oh, it was just the coolest. You, you smokers? Any of you students out there listening to this? Probably not. You're all, I mean, you know, you, you probably just don't use any tobacco, nicotine products at all, you know, because it kills you or whatever. Or if you do, you do the vaping. Oh, vaping is never cool. I'm sorry to break it to you. Don't, don't do it. Uh, you look like you're sucking on a USB drive and a little puff of vapor goes up into the air. Oh, it's, it's not this. Right, no cowboy, whatever vape. All right, so we're going to talk cigarettes, and and I want to discuss. There's this article, the myth of the Marlboro Man by Christopher Salter, an, an old essay about the marketing of place and Marlboro cigarettes and things like that. And I think I have a copy of it in Canvas in the file section. I don't know if I fully link to it in the pages thing, but you you look around, you can find it. And if I didn't, and you want to read it. Send me an email. Um, but with this, the whole idea is that we're, we're dealing with Marlboro cigarettes, which, you know, they marketed as this cowboy cigarette. And you had the Marlboro Man, which was, I mean, there were multiple Marlboro men, these handsome, rugged, very white uh, men who were in cowboy outfits and had cigarettes like we see on the the screen here uh and it they, that's how they sold cigarettes and so what salter here is saying this incredibly popular ad campaign incredibly popular cigarette it was urban folk city folk who were buying these cigarettes right and so the idea is people in cities they're buying marlboro cigarettes they're consciously picking that brand as opposed to, you know, Chesterfields or or Camels or whatever. Um, I, I should have been cooler with all my, my cigarette brands. I'm, I'm letting it slip that I'm not a smoker myself, no matter how the voice sounds. Um, so it, uh, yeah, but, but people are picking this, right, because of the cowboy. And what Salter's saying is that these city folk, they see themselves as being rural at heart. Like a lot of people, you know, going to the city... They're, they're migrating into the city from some other location, right? And they might maybe didn't grow up on a farm, but they didn't grow up in the city itself. They moved to the big city to get that job, to chase that dream, or whatever. And so buying that cigarette, it's a little escape, right? You're escaping back to a simpler place, a rural location. It's all connected to place. But... With this place idea, what I want to stress, and this is something that students don't always quite grasp or, or hold on to, it's, you know, like we think, when we see the Marlboro, oh, yes, it's that, that classic thing of like, oh, yes, uh, women wanted him and men wanted to be like him, um, you know. I mean, there's there's something there, but, but what soldiers are arguing, no. That's not the case. What we're going to say here, it's like with Alexa stuff, it's not, it's not necessarily that, that, you know, men wanted to be like him, women wanted to, to, you know, be with him or anything like that. It was that everybody who's smoking this cigarette, um, they just want a little piece of that, that little momentary escape, right? So let me, let me explain uh, what's going on here. Now, first off, what's important to realize is that Marlboro cigarettes didn't start out as this cowboy western thing, all right? Uh, and we have this ad, I just, oh, I love these old ads. Um, but you can see, like, with this Marlboro, it was like, it was Lord Marlboro or whatever. It was supposed to have this European, you know, aristocracy kind of thing going for it, right? So it was more, it was kind of, you know, urban or old world or however you want to think about it. So like this ad. Uh, from, I don't think I have the date. Oh, I think it says 58 uh, in here, okay? So that's the era we're dealing with. Ladies, now Marlboro talks your language. A new idea from Europe, the Continental Pack. Ten full-size Marlboros and a petite flip-top box that doesn't even crowd an evening bag. 
tailored specifically for the ladies. Individually smart and packed together. Pick up a pair today. Yeah. Yeah, ladies, and some great. It's they're they're little little tiny cigarette packs. Um like a full pack of uh, smokes right there. It's a little tiny lady size one. So your tiny lady hands can can actually hold on to it. You can put it on your tiny little purse and you know, ladies, you know how small you are. Um yeah, this didn't work. Right? This is the whole thing. Like they marketed this stuff, but it was just Marlboro. It wasn't a, a big hugely, you know, successful kind of thing. So so the the ad guys think like, you know, Mad Men kind of stuff. Um they say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna change everything. No, this is Europe nonsense cowboys in the West. That's what they switch to. And so when they do this, what the, what they're going for is, you know, the Marlboro man himself is this, you know, the idea of the guy. Because like I said, it's multiple actors portraying this guy, but it's just the idea that you got this cowboy who's just macho and sexy and and just everything about him and the settings and all this stuff. It's all about the American West and the frontier and the excitement of, you know, heading out and civilizing a landscape and, and, and all that. That's what they're playing up now, right? Very different from that old world kind of marketing that they had. And by the 70s, it's the most popular cigarette in the world. And, and this is a picture, if you haven't really looked at it, and I stole this, I can't take credit for it. I, I wish I could. It's a fantastic picture. This is in Cairo, I believe, in Egypt. Um, and so you've got the Marlboro Man with kind of North African features, right, painted on the wall there. And then you got the local guy down there smoking right next to him. I mean, that's that's fantastic. And it's this worldwide global phenomenon, right? And that, so people are, are smoking Marlboros now like they never had before, all because of the Marlboro Man. So with this guy, right, there's some key things. Salter's listing this stuff out, and he's talking about the fact that the Marlboro Man is always isolated, right? He's away from others. Like you might see a few other cowboys in there, but he's not like in a big crowded urban area. There's a lack of human settlement. Right, so like there, there are no buildings or homes or whatever for a lot of other people to be there to, to crowd them. There's a monumental setting. The idea that you see spectacular mountains and, and scenery that if you're in the city, you're not going to be seeing. Right, you're staring at, at large buildings and, and pavement and all of that. They're playing up when they they zoom out, effectively. Right, when it's not a close shot of just the Marlboro Man himself majestic mountains and, you know, snow-covered peaks, breathtaking desert landscapes, uh, that kind of stuff, right? And just freedom, just oozes freedom. And this quote from Salter, he seeks no one, nor does he appear to need anyone. Mom, man, yeah, right? And just look at this. Just look at this picture. This is so cool, because what is he doing? What's he doing right there? And you're saying, who's lighting a cigarette? Not just lighting a cigarette. Where is he lighting that cigarette? What's also in his hands? There. The reins of a horse, right? He's on the back of a horse. And he's lighting his smoke right there. That's some coordination I can never pull off. Um, I've ridden like two horses in my life. Uh, I want to say not once did I think like, hey, this is working pretty well. And I, I think I'll, I'll light up a cigarette. No. But look at that. Look at that. He's not even, you know, he's not even paying attention. He's just doing it and he's going to go right off and just be... Awesome. Marlboro man. Yeah. Here's another one. See, different guy. Got that sweet mustache right there. Uh, another quote from Salter. He exudes competence, right? They just look like they are they know what they're doing. And they don't need modern technology or whatever, you know. And, they, you know, keep in mind, we're dealing with the 60s and 70s with a lot of these ads going on into the 80s. You know, what is that? technology really what would it look like we don't have smartphones that these guys could be holding on to but still like you don't even see you know cars and, and things like that it's just it's just classic right and so think about it if you're in a city and you're seeing this simpler times and awesome guys and all that that's what that's what what Salter is saying they're they're playing up right here's the monumental landscape so actually in 
Monument Valley right here. Like you, you've got the floating cigarettes up this way. You, you can't really see the guy out here, you know, smoking away or whatever. But it's just, it's just letting you know, right, that this is this is something different from what you're used to. Again, they're not they're not marketing this to cowboys. They're marketing it to urban individuals, right? People are effectively the opposite of this stuff. Um, light cigarettes. I mean, that, that should be a thing. That should be mocked, right? Like diet soda and light beer. Like, whoa, what's the matter with you? But lights, it's just, it's it's cool. Nobody says like, hey, what's the matter with you? You, you only smoke the, the diet cigarettes. Um, no, it's it's kind of like, you know what? When it's, when it's winter out and I'm out, Riding my horse with my buddy, um, you know, I, I switch to the lights when the, when the air is a little colder, a little harder to to, to breathe, and I'll, I'll smoke the lights and then and switch it back to the the regulars, um, you know, in the summer months. I, I I don't know, but it's still they're just they're still playing up this tough, competent, awesome stuff. They're telling stories right here. Look at the he catches. I'm sure that's a wild Mustang uh, out there, and they, you know, and he comes back to the barn or whatever. I don't know. I know nothing uh, about this stuff. Uh, but he comes back and he's like, yep, got a, got a, got a Mustang. Here she is. Uh, and, and the friends are like, oh, that's great. Let's have a smoke. Like, it's just, it's just, oh, oh, fantastic. Oh, and I just, don't you just, you want, you, you, you hungry for cigarettes right now? Because you just, it's so cool. You want to be there, right? You, you want this stuff. So it's the idea is that we want to live in Marlboro country, right? Which is kind of the general term for this Wild West setting that, that they have. That clearly, you know, shifts. It's it's all over the West. It's not a specific place, but it's the idea that it's, it's you know, the general idea of simpler frontier macho life, right? That's the idea. And again, macho, this might be my favorite ad right here. Like, look how cool that guy is. He just, he pulls a stick out of the fire to light his Marlboro cigarette. That is awesome. That is so, like, I can't even pull off a jean jacket. Uh, that's cool. Let alone chaps or whatever. And if I tried to light a cigarette with, with a fire stick like that, I'd burn my whole face off, right? Competence, awesome freedom, and, you know, I, uh, I want that. But... What Salter is saying is that desire, it's a myth, right? It's not, that's not really what we want. And so this, this quote, this is great here. We covet the image, we avoid the reality. So what he's saying is to covet, we want that. We lust after that image, right? There, that idea of me, like for me, I'll, I'll just say me personally, because I'm sure you guys are like, oh, no, that doesn't look cool at all. You liars. But I'll just say it for me. God, that looks so cool, right? Uh, I have all my denim on and my hat and my chaps and, and all that stuff. I'll be out, you know, just kind of camping out there as I'm moving cows from one place to another. Or, you know, whatever it is a cowboy does. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, and, and, oh, man, that, that would be fantastic. But here's the thing. I could easily do that, right? Like, if I wanted to... I could drop out of society. I could go to, to uh, even, hell, I don't even have to quit my job. Honestly, I could spend my summers out on a ranch if I wanted to, right? I'm a professor. I get to, I get to totally pull that off. So let's say, you know, during the fall and the spring semesters, uh, I'll be here in the Antelope Valley doing my thing. And then in the summer, I head up to Montana, right, with my denim, and I'll go do the, the, the cow I don't even know what you you do. Um, I don't even have a jean jacket. I don't. Um, I mean, I could I could do it though. I could I could definitely. I don't take classes to be a cab. I don't even know how you become a cab. I, I, I'm sure we have like a certificate program at ABC. I don't. I don't even know. Um, yeah, you know you know what? Okay, so here, here's what I mean. That's so cool. I mean, I'm not gonna do it. I got kids, and it could be hard. So I'm just I'm just gonna pick up a pack of these cigarettes uh and i'll smoke a pack of marlboros and then you know and i'll be good and i'll get back to my suburban lifestyle um you know here in the antelope valley right that's coveting the image and then avoiding the reality right it's the idea that oh it looks so cool 
but you don't actually put forth the effort. You don't actually work to do it, right? That's the key thing. And we've got that all over the place. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, cowboys, right? And and here's the other thing, too. Is it Salter is saying, he calls it the curse of, of the Marlboro Man. And that we, because we spend so much time lusting after this frontier lifestyle, like, you know, living like a cowboy. We fail to see the folk art of the city or blah. I hate cities. You'll, you'll learn about that later on. Um, they just smell like pee uh, and you get stabbed. But anyway, we'll get to that. Um, so I don't fully, you know run with with Salter with this idea of oh the city is folk art um no it has to be uh but it, it is that idea that we we kind of forget we we're so busy chasing after this fantasy that we avoid actually doing anything to make our lives better right or to appreciate what we have or, or whatever it might be now you might not you know look at this it is it is kind of a dated thing and it's a real 60s 70s kind of vibe this idea of wanting to return to nature and, and, you know, be more free and not be held down by the man and all that. We don't necessarily have that today. So maybe maybe the cowboy thing isn't quite doing it for you, right? Maybe maybe not. I don't know. I found this. Um, this is how, this is the Lake Hughes um, uh, little gas station mini mart thing out there. <laughs> and uh, and this, uh, you know, they got the cigarette ads up on the, the side of the building. And I saw this and I went, oh, oh, yeah. I mean, uh, oh, this clearly, it's it's making fun of the Marlboro Man, right? It's saying, like, who wants to smoke that old bastard cigarette where you're riding around on a horse? If you want a good smoke, you want USA Gold, right? Which I'm sure is the, the best smoke around uh, yeah, I don't know um, but yeah so it's the idea that if you're a modern day cowboy you're going to pick up a box a pack, a box uh, a container uh, of USA Gold cigarettes that's what you're going to do uh, because what is this uh, you know we, we got we got clear cowboy imagery look at her she's got the cowboy boots on and, and, and all that but, but where's the horse there's no horse right except for a steel horse Except for that motorcycle, and my God, that is so cool. I mean, I want. Oh, here's the deal, guys. I'm not allowed to have a motorcycle because of my stupid wife. Um, she just, you know, she's so dumb. She, I, oh, motor. Like I rode, like you know, dirt bikes and stuff as a kid. But the problem was, I never went ahead and caught like a Harley or whatever in college. You know, before I got married, so I waited too long, and then my wife's like, you can't have a motorcycle. She's so stupid. So, oh, you know, it'd be, oh, maybe what I should, I'm just going to divorce her. I think that's, uh, this is, you heard it here first, folks. I'm going to, she's done. I'm done with her, because she's, she's not letting me have a motorcycle. I'm going to, first I get rid of her, and then I buy the motorcycle. I'm going to go to the Harley dealership. Pick up a sweet hog, and and you're gonna know, right? Like you're gonna hear all over town. Even though you're at home, you know, watching this lecture and you're taking notes and all this stuff, you're just gonna hear that rumbling outside. That's me. That's me. And of course, you know, recording this during COVID pandemic times, we're teaching remotely. This isn't on campus. Oh, I can't wait till we get back to to campus, because then I can when I'm coming into class, because I don't really drive anywhere right now. But when I when I actually have a commute. Again, I'm gonna take my my sweet motorcycle, my steel horse, and I'm gonna you're gonna rumble onto campus. Um, yeah, and you know what I'm gonna do? <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, Cause I got rid of my wife. I'm gonna I'm gonna get somebody new who's awesome, uh, like this young lady who's just, I mean just bless her heart. Look how wonderful she is, right? And it looks perfect. So you know I'm gonna find one of these. Too. And she's going to be on the back of my motorcycle. Life is looking fantastic for me. Except I'm kind of looking. Oh, and this, I, I wish you guys were here because we could look at this together. We could actually deconstruct the image. But if we look at it, if we look at this, does this guy look happy? Because I've been looking at the young lady, the charming young lady here. But the, the guy, he doesn't look too thrilled. 
Does it? Does it? He looks kind of grumpy, sad, depressed, maybe. And then you look, you look back to her, and she looks lovely. And I'm sure she's got a really good heart and uh, very wise uh, beyond her years. But you look at her. Um, I mean, uh, what's she wearing? Yeah, she's got the cowgirl boots. She she has the the jeans, right? I clearly, I've already established. I love me the denim. Um, and then what is this? A bikini top, right there. That sounds safe at all. Do you know what a motorcycle can do to the human body? Like, if you it doesn't even have to be like a massive wreck. You can just hit a corner a little too fast and, and slide. She is going to be destroyed. Right? Her whole body just scraped up, scarred, you know, not to mention broken bones and, and, and all that. That is not safe. I mean, the guy has the leather jacket. You know, at least he's he's prepared there. But that, that helmet, he's not going to do anything for her torso. Right? What is wrong with her? That is just, and you know, I mean, you look at her. Oh, my God. You can just tell. She is trouble. Right? Like, for the first week or whatever it would be fantastic, uh, you know, fun to, to hang out with it, but then you just get tired, right? I'm an old man. I don't, I don't do stuff at all. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't go out past eight, uh, o'clock, but you, you look at her, she'd be like, let's go dancing or, you know, like whatever. And it would just be like, no. And so I could see, oh, it, it's not going to be like, like you said, it'd be great for the first week. And then after that, we're going to be shouting at each other. And she's like, you know, fun. And, and, blah, and, and I would never hit anyone, really. But, but you know, I'd be pushing it. Um, this act, now that I think about it, this looks awful, right? So even though, I can't lie, I look at that and I'm still, I'm torn. I, I, oh, that looks so fantastic. What a life. I want to be a modern day cowboy, clearly. But I don't want to do that. And, you know, my wife, we have, you know, our bank accounts connected and things are, it would be hard. You know, divorce would be difficult. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to start smoking USA Gold cigarettes. And that way, when I take that drag off that fine, fine cigarette, I can, I can fantasize a little bit about, about having that motorcycle and that young companion. Uh, but I don't actually have to go through that hell, Right. To be that sad old guy who picks up the girl with issues and, and all that, right? Covet the image, avoid the reality. So that's what marketing is. So think about that. As you, I didn't want to give anything away, but let's just say we have like a midterm exam, uh, and I ask you a question about the Marlboro Man and, and stuff like that. Think, be ready to have your own example, and these are examples are out there. All the time, and but but also keep in mind. Remember that idea of coveting the image, avoiding the reality, right? Because it's out there. As you say, you know, watch TV, uh, and you'll you'll see that, like like real TV, not like Netflix stuff, but you know the stuff with commercials. Um, you know, you watch that, you see stuff, and you see things that look pretty cool, but when you really start to think about it, you realize, oh, they're selling this sense of place. Right, whether it's tomorrow world country or even this, the open highway, um, or you know other stuff. So think about the geography of these things, but also think about, you know, are they really selling this to people who already have that, right? Or are they selling this to people who don't have it and never will have it or will never work to have it? But it's a nice thought, right? Think about that. That's uh, that's um, that's uh, worth pondering. I'll say so. That there you go. Okay, no motorcycle for me. All right, so that's that difference. Well, let's just keep moving forward here, and let's talk about when we have difference that isn't fun, or exciting, or sexy, or whatever. We have difference forced upon someone or a group of someones or whatever. Right? We have difference that exists because of a hegemon, which is, we go back to our hegemony, the, the idea of a hegemon is that person or group or whatever who is controlling others without the use of sheer force. All right? So it's, you've got somebody with power or some buddies with power who make sure part of that keeping that power is to keep others feeling different. All right? And we have uh, um, 
you know, Jim Crow segregation throughout the South. It's a great example, an obvious example of that, where you had the white folks had their stuff, uh, and the black folks had their stuff, and it was the eyes separate but equal, right? It was this myth that was, was kept, that like, you know, the white folks are just happy around other white folks, and black folks are happy around other black folks, and let's just keep them separate. And, uh, um, you know, and it, but it's equal. You, they, they still have, you know, movie theaters and restaurants and stuff like that. And, of course, the, the myth of equality is that the, the non-white institutions and, you know, places, businesses, stuff like that, it was kept not as good so that, that people could be kept in their place, right? Think of that, that you know, saying there, to, to keep someone in their place or put someone in their place. It's a spatial metaphor, but it can, it can be literal and it can be figurative at the, the same time, right? That's what we're dealing with here. Uh, and what where it becomes a real problem is when that idea of difference becomes natural, all right, that goes back to hegemony and the idea of common sense and all that. When we start to think of something as being naturally a certain way, or the way we do things currently is just the way we've always done things because it's just the best, that's, that's where power just surges through and, and people are kept out of power. All right, that's a huge problem. All right, um, and it's not just here. Um, this is a great old-timey image here. So in a bar with the God Bless America. I love uh, that right there. And it, to, um, to be perfectly honest, I've been in a few bars uh, in my day. This one, if I walked in there um, and saw these people staring back at me, I'd probably turn around. This is not this is not a good looking bar. Um, let me tell you, you know, for you, you 18, 19, 20 year olds who are taking this class, uh, yeah, bars are way better. Um, and this one here, and of course you see that charming sign up at the top, positively, no beer sold to Indians. I mean, just right there, they're letting you know you're a white person, and honestly, you know, it doesn't say anything about it, but in theory, if an African-American bar patron came in wanting a drink, in theory, he or she could get a beer. Looking at these folks, probably not. Um, you know, just the, based on the time, I don't know. Don't imply anyone is horribly bigoted. Um, but I mean, but that's, I mean, come on. Right, and I remember back when I showed this years ago. Now, in a lecture talking about either this or, or something else, I remember a student saying, "Well, yeah, but it's because you know Native Americans have uh, more difficulty with with alcoholism, higher rates of alcoholism, and, and all that." And he just kind of left it there, like, you know, what are you gonna? It's to help those people. Right, bless his heart. Um, you know, not saying that this guy was, you know, he didn't have a swastika on or, or whatever. But what he was saying is it was just kind of natural in his mind. That, well, yeah, you don't want to sell alcohol to Indians. They can't hold their liquor. Right? Which, yeah. I mean, that, that could work if... We had no documentation of alcoholism in any other racial category, right? Like if it's like, you know, white people, they can hold their booze. Um, no, no, let, let me tell you, as a white person, um, no, we're not genetically superior when it comes to not getting uh, hooked on the substances, um, not making horrible decisions with substances, stuff like that. It's nonsense, right? The, the idea of alcohol affecting one racial group more than another because of something natural or biological and like inherently biological? No. The reason why Indians have, you know, if they even do, I, I don't have the statistics themselves, um, but let's say they do have higher rates of, you know, substance abuse and, you know, whether it's alcohol or drugs or, or whatever. It's not because they're Indians, right? It's not because of some indigenous quality that only they have. It's because their people were murdered, right? Because of the genocide that took place to uh, uh, to sweep Indians away, 
right? So that uh, the Euro Americans could come in and uh, and and really use North America properly, right? Really, really, you know, make this place sweet. Uh, Indians weren't doing that, right? So murder and, and and if you say like well oh, no no we want to do that we would um it's important we acknowledge that there was a real conscious effort to eradicate the indigenous people who were here so that there wasn't ever an issue with that with rights to land uh and all that so that was clearly a case and those who weren't eradicated were moved to reservations which is the garbage land that the white folks didn't want, and so they pushed the Indians over there into just horrible conditions, and you know, with no hope, no future. So, like, do you think do you think alcoholism is a case of, you know, having having a gene that makes you more susceptible to it, or is it the fact that you know there have been I don't know two three hundred years of just, I mean, and you can even go back if you want to go back to Columbus. I mean, we can go all the way back there let's let's round it let's say you know five centuries uh of just getting screwed right and having no bright future ahead of you like what do you think is really the the thing there right but if we make it natural if we're just kind of well you know how those people are then then something like this might not look horribly racist horribly evil and it might not be obvious that we're forcing difference like one group is forcing difference on another, right? That it's not hegemony at work. That's what we're dealing with. And so that's what Kay Anderson's The Idea of Chinatown article is all about. It's looking at, is this idea of Chinatown, is it natural? Is it authentic? If you, and that authentic, I've used it a few times already in this class. Authenticity it's a tricky word. And, and the next lecture, I'll get into what that actually means and how we use it and, and all that. But uh, that's that's for another day, right? But with China, like for me, I'll admit, I was not well-versed in this stuff. Um, you know, a naive kid uh, who's not Chinese, uh, you know, has no, no connection to you know, any East Asian, really any Asian cultures in general. Um, so, you know, for me, when I, you know, first heard of Chinatown, it was just kind of, oh, that's, that's where the Chinese people decided to live. And, you know, Chinese people, they like other Chinese people. They just spoke Chinese and they like you know, dragons and, and fancy buildings and all that stuff. So when they came to like San Francisco, they said, hey, well, let's set up camp over here. And they just built their buildings in the same way that they would build them over in China, all right? That, that seems reasonable. Um, if you don't think about it, it seems natural, especially when you think about how in school, you know, elementary school, we're taught about the idea of immigration and, and we see kind of this rosy picture ideas of like, you know, Ellis Island and, and uh, you know, people coming into the country to have a better life and really settle it and the American dream and all that. And we never think about how immigration can actually be a pretty evil awful horrible thing for people when they get over here uh, at least we don't we don't get that in elementary school right um so uh you know with that you might think that chinatown is just where the chinese folks decided to live right uh and then you know also i in in that video i did about how to read um and using Kay anderson's article to start with that, she, her whole setup is the idea of, she has this, you know, racist uh, quote uh, at the beginning and she does the whole, you know, this could be more proof as if more were needed of the racism that people met. So, right, the other idea is that, well, the Chinese people came over and they wanted to hang out. Um, but they, they met with some racist people who were like, ooh, I don't like you Chinese. And so they said, well, this sucks. All right, let's just go over here. Let's just set up camp over here and we'll build our cities and, you know, the, the way we do our buildings, the way we do, and, and so on. And Anderson, of course, is saying, no, no, that's what a chump would think. No, it's not that at all, right? So with this, I mean, the whole idea with this too, we can connect this back to reading the landscape. Not only are we talking about difference and force difference, but the idea of if you went to Chinatown, like let's say 
I, I got us a bus and I, I took us down to LA's Chinatown, right? We have a little field trip and, and we can't do that uh, because of, of, you know, horrible disease and COVID and all that. And I, I ain't got time for that. You ain't got time for that. But let's, let's say, right? So we go down to, the, to China and we could look at it. We can look at the buildings and get into our, you know, reading the landscape stuff, not just looking at the pretty stuff, looking at the ugly stuff, trying to pull out the culture from the buildings themselves. What? Looking at a place like Chinatown and reading an article like Anderson's here, what it was doing is saying you can't just you can't just look at what's there. You have to dig deeper. You have to get more into the material historical context of this place, right? That's the general idea here that, that she's getting at, right? So that's what we're going to kind of see an example of. So what Anderson is arguing with this article, and she's done other work uh, as well on this topic, but what she's saying is that Chinatown, it's constructed in a literal and a figurative sense, Right, in the idea, like literal meaning, that yeah, there's there's an actual Chinatown that we can still see. She's dealing with Vancouver's Chinatown, but we said we can go to that one, or we can go to San Francisco, or LA, or wherever. Right, we got them all over the place. Um, so yeah, there's an actual place, but she's also, and this is the real key thing, is she's saying Chinatown was constructed in this figurative sense. It's made up. It's a social construct, and she's saying it's the white folks that made it up, right? It's not that the Chinese people came over here, met some racists, and like, this sucks. Let's go build us a Chinatown. No, it was the white folks. Yeah, they were racist, but they also said, you're Chinese, you're different, you live in Chinatown, right? That's, that's the big thing. Chinatown exists not because of the Chinese, but because of the white folks, because the white folks in that area didn't want the Chinese, you know, mingling, assimilating, any of that stuff, right? And that, that's another big thing with immigration. There's always that idea of like, well, why don't the immigrants assimilate? It's a big thing with uh, Latin American immigration, um, you know, from Mexico, Central America, wherever. Um, in Southern California, you got the people who just, ah, why can't they just assimilate, right? Meaning... You know, why can't they be more like white folks? That's, that's kind of really the, the general idea. Why can't they be like a normal American, which does kind of have this, which basically means white folk, um, in there. But when we when we say that, and then there's nothing wrong with the idea of assimilating. I'm not saying, like, if you come up here from Guatemala, you keep speaking Spanish and living like you're in Guatemala. Like, no, it's, of course, if you... you or an immigrant, and you, you move into a new place, it's, yeah, yes, you want to learn how to live in that place, and learn the customs, and the culture, and, you know, and, and fit in. Everybody wants that. The real thing, what, what people never really question is, well, maybe, maybe people can assimilate. Maybe they really want to, but they're never allowed to, right? Maybe that force difference is upon them. That's what Anderson is saying with the idea of Chinatown. And the other thing, too, is that this stuff, right? The flashy buildings and the you know the colors and the curved roofs and the dragons and lions and all that stuff. We look at that, and we're like, man, China's awesome, right? I bet everything over there looks like this. It's just like Disneyland, cool. Um, no, no, we, you know, it's like we not everything here in the U.S. looks like the Statue of Liberty. Right? Or, or Mount Rushmore or, or whatever, right? There's there's a certain played up kind of thing. But if you're not really questioning it, you might just look at that and be like, man, them Chinese, they are fantastic. And we can even, you can even be so stupid about stuff like this. Um, a Chinese restaurant in New Orleans. Um, I, just, it, I love it because it's so American. I didn't go in. I should have gone in. I don't even know. You know, if it's an actual Chinese family who put it together or whatever, but just the sign, this is this is our level of like China here, where not only is it the moonwalk, right, like a Michael Jackson reference, um, but it's the idea of that font, right? There's there's nothing Chinese about it other than the font looks like it was painted on, 
you know, with a thick brush or whatever. So we look at that and we go, oh, that, look at that. That's Chinese as hell. I bet that food is so authentic, right? Because look at how the, they, they brushed that that on there. No, but we don't, we don't question. We just have this general idea uh, of what's going on. And here's another thing, too, to think about. And, and some of you guys mentioned this, too. Like, Anderson's painting this picture of, of Chinatown as this awful, dirty, violent place and all that. Um, but something changed, right? So we'll, we'll get to that, too. Which she doesn't get into into the article. She's talked about it in other places. Other people have, have spoken and written about this. So we'll cover that as well. Like, how do we get to the place of violence and sin to fun, the place where you take the kids, right? That, so we'll, we'll get to that. All right, so with Anderson, she's, she's talking about Vancouver, right? In British Columbia, in, in Canada. And so it really, it starts, Chinese workers show up there in the Yukon in general uh, after our gold rush here in California, right? So we have, you know, 1848 gold is discovered, 49, you know, in the 49ers, we have people coming here panning for gold and all that in California it is pretty quickly, you know, the, all the easy stuff is gone and people are not doing well here. But Eureka, we discover some gold up in Canada. So on the, the West Coast. So we have this gold rush up there about a decade later. All right. So then every, you know, people who didn't do well here, they head on up to uh, Western Canada to try to, you know, make it rich there. And it's, it's, people of European descent, white folk, like people actually from Europe itself or people from the United States or the parts of Canada who originally, their ancestors, came over from Europe, white folks, right? But we also have uh, Chinese workers. And there are other races uh, coming in and ethnicities and nationalities. You, you know, you have the Japanese didn't meet the same kind of, of racism and racial prejudice as uh, the Chinese did, right? For what it is a whole thing uh, in there. But for the Chinese specifically, as soon as they show up into Vancouver, they're meeting these, their discrimination policies in place. Uh, and there's this general idea of what Chinese people are like. And that also leads to violence against the Chinese. It's not a good scenario. But it's also kind of this idea of it's it's still, you know, it's it's what these people who are coming here. It, it's their best option, right? It's kind of it's what they can actually, you know, succeed in. Hopefully, it's it's a gamble, right? They're willing to put up with it, risk this stuff, deal with all this discrimination to try to make a living, right? So that's that's our setting in here. And so with Chinatown, we have this concentration of immigrants, but it's really the idea that these people could not live anywhere else, right? They weren't allowed to assimilate, to mingle and all that, because the white folks in there, they viewed the Chinese as just being awful, and that if you have Chinese people near you, your whole city's going to fall apart, right? Your neighborhood, your city, they're going to corrupt your children and, and all that, and that's just how these people are. Right? It's the, the idea of being made natural. Chinese uh, immigrants were seen as being subhuman. They weren't, you know, good humans like you and me, pal. They're different. Right? And so it's the idea that they're dirty, right? unsanitary. They're a filthy people, and they're prone to vice, gambling, drugs, prostitution, stuff like that. They're just they're just morally despicable and and physically gross right that was the idea and i'm just distressed this is the idea of racist white folk you know over 100 years ago saying it's not me saying it all right um but this is this is the idea this is what chinese immigrants are stepping into this general idea here and of course the thing is i mean thing 1850s you know, in, in Vancouver and just the, you know, West in North America in general, you're going to find plenty of unsanitary conditions, right? It's just, it's going to be dirty all over just because it's, it's, you're like camping all the time, 
right? Because people are moving into new places, starting new cities and, and so on. But it's the idea for white folks, it's a temporary thing. Once we get this city underway, other white folks, we're going to be good. It's going to be clean. It's going to be wonderful, right? For the Chinese, again, it's natural. Here's a quote from Anderson. The difficulty to get Chinese people to adopt sanitary methods, even where every convenience is provided. Look, Chinese are generally dirtier than whites. All right? And this is the kind of stuff, these quotes, and by the way, this is also, if you haven't read it, this isn't, um, uh, you know, Kay Anderson saying this. She's on a flaming races. She's quoting primary sources from, you know, this point in time as Chinatown is, is developing. And so a lot of her stuff, it's from, you know, early... 20th century, late 19th century, not like right at the gold rush necessarily, but she's showing this evolution of the idea and of the place. And so this is, you know, official stuff. She's doing stuff from newspapers and publications, government meetings and, and things like that. Like this is, this is the discourse. This is what white people are saying. And it's the kind of deal where nobody is going like, Bill, you can't say that. Right? Nobody's just stepping up and, and saying, like, I, I don't think that's cool. Um, you know, let alone saying, like, you're a racist dick. Right? Nobody's saying that. This is what people think. And you see it. You see it today. Sal, I mean, you, you, I've, oh, I've talked to family members um, who kind of, you know, have, have this, this feeling. And, and you, you got to say, I uh, love you. Um, but what's wrong with you, right? Try to, to uh, or at least do some kind of, you know, like verbal judo to try to get them not thinking that way. Or, you know, that's, you guys know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. Whether it's, you know, a racial, racial thing or something about, you know, LGBT stuff or, you know, whatever. Take your pick. You've got that uncle, right? Or, or grandma, bless her heart. Um, so, yeah, this is stuff that's being set. And, of course, too, the other thing that's not really gotten into here is the idea that uh, Chinese workers aren't earning the same amount as white folks. They're being kept in poverty conditions. And so if you're not making a lot of money, is it possible to not live in, in crowded, run-down buildings, right? Like the Chinese were doing at this point in time. Is it, is it you know... Can you have a really nice estate that you live in and, and have nice clothing and, and things like that? No. No, because you're just barely surviving, right? But again, people just look to that. They won't point to the actual material conditions. They won't say, oh, maybe if we actually paid them the same amount we pay white folks, they would be just like the white folks. Uh, no, instead it's, well, you know how they are, right? They're just generally dirtier than us whites. That's what's going on. And this is part of that figurative uh, construction of Chinatown. Uh, they're also, it's, it's this evil, this place of evil and opium is a big deal. And, and there's a whole history of like the whole idea with opium. Um, it, it, we can blame the British actually for pulling it out of, of China and making it into this drug that it is. And if opium, I mean, it's kind of an old timey drug. I don't know if you guys are, if you kids are hip, uh, to opium. I don't know if that's the kind of drug you're doing these days, you you college kids. Um, but you can think, you know, think heroin, right? If if you want to, or even meth, you can can uh, think of it that way. Um, so it, it it's you know heavy stuff uh, that's going on. But the Chinese people are seen as they just they love this stuff. They're degenerates. They just love to uh, smoke opium, and because that's who they are. Even though there's plenty of proof that the Chinese were saying, could we? Could you guys, could we keep the drugs out of here? Could we maybe have some tougher drug laws and, and stuff? This is, this is killing our people. Could we get rid of it? Um, no. No, because it's natural, right? And here's, this is from, this isn't from Anderson. This is actually from San Francisco's Chinatown, an image from a newspaper, uh, late 19th century kind of stuff. And you can see it might be kind of hard to read on your screen. Um, but it's, it's showing, it's in California, an evening in the Chinese quarter of San Francisco, the Chinaman's Paradise, a favorite haunt of opium smokers on Kearney Street. All right, so it's the, uh, the Chinaman's Paradise, 
right? Like, let's, let's so like, hey, hey, don't say Chinaman. Um, they, they go over that in the Big Lebowski. It's very clear. But let, let's say that was acceptable at the time. It wasn't as horribly racist uh, as it would be today to use that, like I just did. Um, so you don't, you know, don't, don't say that is what I'm saying. But it's the idea of the paradise, right? Again, it's that naturalization. It's that thing like, this is what these people love. And you've got the prudish women there and this, this guy. They're just they're staring. They're just judging. Just, you know, judge, judge, judge. And these guys are just like, hey, man, what's up? This guy's like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, look at this. Look at this guy right there. I don't like the way he's looking. He's just, he's staring at me. He's like, ah, I'm going to corrupt you. All right, I'm going to steal your women. Ah, that kind of deal. That's bullshit. That is nonsense. This is so awful in the sense that it's it's done in a way to make white people just look at it and go, God, that is so sad. God, those people, that is just so sad. But what, you can, what can you do? You can't help them, right? That's just how these people are, right? which is nonsense. But it's, it's through media, it's through discourse, it's through just saying this stuff, right? It gets repeated. And that's why the, the idea of a Chinatown just seems like it seems like something you have to have, right? The Chinese people don't want to assimilate. They can't because they're not, you know, like a normal person. So yeah, they got to stay over there. Even if we're not going to be racist to them, just keep them over there because they're just different, right? That's the idea. That's what Anderson is... He's getting a prostitution, same kind of deal. Here's some Gold Rush era prostitutes. That was a fun little Google search that I um, did for my office too. I always, when I'm, you know, searching for images like that, I make sure I'm on school property. Um, but, but yeah, we, we've got, it was it was white prostitutes that we're dealing with because it's, like it's men coming over from China uh, to do the work for the most part, uh, and and so it's you know white ladies are the prostitutes, and they were prostitutes outside of Chinatown. Then they kept getting pushed into Chinatown, and the, the Chinese guys were like, could you, could you keep, could we keep the prostitutes maybe like in your neighborhood where they started, like she, she's from this, this area, can she just stay there and do her prostitution stuff if you're not gonna, you know, stop prostitution or whatever? And, and you know, the officials are like, oh, you, um, yeah. So again, same idea. That it's, it, there's nothing particularly racial about this at all in that, you know, the Chinese are inherently this way or whatever, but it's still, it's made to seem that way. And what's also crazy too, you could say, well, if white people are so superior, why, why are all your daughters turning into prostitutes? White folk, right? And, and what you do, this is, this is how racists are just so good at stuff. And we'll talk about ideology and how you use racism to kind of deal with contradictions and stuff like that. We'll talk about that later on. Um, racism is never about logical reasoning, which is why you can't go to some racist and say like, hmm, have you ever thought of this? And show them a chart and show them a human genome and explain how it doesn't make sense. And like, you're not going to make a guy not be racist with facts, right? It's all ideological, but it's the idea. If you point out, they're like, "Oh, the prostitutes are white. Where's your superior race now?" They'd say, "Look, you know, we are superior as white people, as people of European descent. So we're the best." But the Chinese are so mad that if they get close enough to like our young women, they're gonna corrupt them, right? They just they have it's like a disease, right? So yeah, clearly white people, white biology, white culture, all that stuff superior, but you get too close to a Chinese person, it, it ruins everything. It's like kryptonite or whatever. It's very unfortunate, but, but think Superman, right? Super awesome. But yeah, there's kryptonite. I mean, it happens, right? Nobody's perfect, but white people were like Superman, is what I'm saying. You, you follow? So that that's the, it's just more of this nonsense, but that's what how people would justify it. The fact that it, no, this isn't just about being Chinese or not Chinese or whatever. The racist ideology is used to kind of make connections that don't make sense. And, you know, just just so people can stay sane and keep keep hating uh, to get through life. Right? Uh, that's the idea here. Uh, and so, and this is a cartoon from Anderson's stuff. 
uh, the typical home of the Vancouver white working man. And it's kind of hard to see in just the black and white, but you got that nice, look at that nice house. Beautiful. And here's the guy coming home from work, right? And we know he is because he's a working man. Uh, so he's coming home from work and his little daughter uh, is right there just running up to greet him. You see that? And if that wasn't pure and good and wonderful enough, let's just get that same girl just jumping rope uh, over there and just, oh, perfect. Okay. And then down here, we have a Warren on, I don't know, it's Carroll Street, Carroll Street. I've never been to Vancouver. Um, send in your emails if you if you know. Uh, but infested with 2,000 Chinese. Okay? Now, when you look at that, my little astute geographers, um, I mean, what's going on there? Infested? Do people infest something? No. No, that's what, you know, insects do that. Rats do that, right? And by 2,000 Chinese uh, and the Warren thing, like referring to like where we keep rabbits, if we breed rabbits and all like it's just everything, it's dehumanizing, clearly. And, you know, to really uh, sell it, we've got the guy smoking the opium there. You just got the feet of some passed out Got, you know, they're lazy and they're on drugs and they're gross and, and all that. That's just how these people are. And it's labeled the unanswerable argument, right? Saying, come on. It's just, you can't come on. Look at this. Look, good, bad, good, bad, right? That's what, that's what's going on here. It's unanswerable. It's just, it's how these people are. And in this country, we did this after 9-11. Um, this was a big deal where a lot of people, even people who meant well, said, look, look, I'm not saying all Muslims are bad, but you know how these people are, right? And it was it was the idea, it wasn't race, right, that, that was being used, although it was very racial, but it was the idea of religion, that if you're not Christian, if you're Muslim, well, you're just, you're different. You're just different. And there are plenty of people who would, you know, who who are, would think something like this, with this anti-Chinese stuff, would be like, that's disgusting. But then when it came to Muslims after 9-11, I was like, well, you know how they are. It's kind of an unanswerable argument, right? You know, that, that idea. It happens all the time. And that's, uh, and it's absurd. But it happens. And so she's looking at, well, how does this happen and, and again the whole idea is it's not that the Chinese have this biological difference or even really it's not that they have this cultural difference that just makes them different or incompatible with you know living with Euro Americans you know Euro Canadians whatever it's the idea that, that we have this power of definition right it's a great line from the article it's that the white folks had the power to define what it meant to be Chinese, right? Chinese people didn't have that ability. They couldn't, they couldn't even say like, you know, we're not all on drugs. We're not all dirty. And honestly, if you guys, we would, we would gladly fix this place up. Uh, you know, we get some help. Maybe if you pay us the same wage as what you're paying each other, you know, for, we're actually working harder, but making less. Like if you, if, if we want to make it equitable, uh, we will gladly assimilate. Uh, and you know, blend in and you know we'll be cool no that that wasn't even an option right uh and it was it still there's a lot of this you know you can continue on there's like read the thing don't rely on this alone um but it's the idea i'm starting to laugh i just whenever i see white girl slaves i just just crack up how can you not um but you know read through again this idea of defining the idea that, uh, you know, they're not just prostitutes, they're white girl slaves who are owned by Chinese slave owners, even if they didn't originate in Chinatown, blah, 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 right? It's there. So that's what she's getting at. But, as I mentioned before, we still have this issue of Chinatown today. Today's Chinatown. We don't go to, like, you guys, when, when you're looking for a prostitute, students do you go down to chinatown do you drive all the way down there no right there are other places this again this is why i wish we had um we're in class so so you guys could shout out like where you would go 
to define a prostitute. Like if you're in LA, you know, Hollywood, I would think would be a better spot up here. You know, Sierra Highway, somebody would, would shout that. Um, yeah, I mean, Chinatown is not the place. You go, or if you need good drugs, you're not going to be like, well, let's go see the Chinese. Uh, no, right? You go to Chinatown because you want to have a good meal and, and look at pretty buildings and take the kids and, you know, buy different hats and, and things like that. Chinatown is this tourist attraction. It's a, it's a destination. It's a place to go to have fun. So it starts out as a place of evil, and now it's a place of uh, good times. What happened? Right? And, and that's Anderson doesn't get into it with this article. She's, she's setting it up. She's explaining why it is, you know, why there is a Chinatown, where this idea comes from, right? And tries to get us thinking about race and place and, and all of that. But we should still, like, one question you should have is, like, well, okay, if it's so bad, why did my parents take me there when I was a kid? Right? Why do I like to go there with my boyfriend? Because, you know, I, I love the the restaurant or, you know, whatever. Right? So the idea is, during the Depression, so we see stuff like, you know, 1907 and 1908 or some of the dates for these, you know, newspaper cartoons and all that. But then you, you move forward. A few decades get into the Great Depression, this economic downturn, you start to see people are getting desperate. Like, how can we how can we make money? How can we survive in this new economy? And so this is a quote from Don Mitchell, uh, another geographer here, discussing this transformation. So it was a process of realization that the exoticism of Chinatown was not so much dangerous as it was an economic opportunity right it's the idea that yeah it's different but not like evil you know hold on to your daughters uh, kind of you know different but more like fun fun different right it's kind of more exciting different think vegas right it's the idea like in vegas you have you know mobsters and and all that in the original days i mean i'm sure there might uh, still be those folks there, but today you go there for kind of like that. You go there for that danger, right? But you don't, you're not expecting to actually get, you know, caught up in some mob hit or, or whatever. It's it's pretend. It's fantasy, right? That was the idea here. So that's when this stuff shows up, right? The big colorful things and the fun stuff. This wasn't there. You go back to that cartoon with the Warren on uh, whatever street invested by 2,000 Chinese you didn't see the curved roof line and the dragons and Chinese characters and all that. No, because these people were poor and struggling to get by and dealing with all sorts of stuff. And honestly, if they started to put up this kind of stuff, the white folks probably would have said, ah, they're infesting us, sir. You know, we're going to be corrupted and would have burned it down, right? So this comes later. When white city officials say, okay, all right. We're going to work with you guys, really, to try to drum up, you know, tax dollars and, and bring people into the city and so on, right? This is an image from San Francisco. And it is, I mean, when you think about it, it is kind of just stupid and ridiculous to think that this poor, marginalized group would come over and be like, well, we need lampposts and let's put some dragons on it, right? Like, it's not, no, no, um, this all is... For tourists, again, it's it's not about the Chinese. It's not that Chinese people look at this and go like, ah, uh, just like home. No, it's like this is what the, the white folk, uh, they'll eat this up, right? So there's some working together with white city officials and, and Chinese leadership in the, the specific Chinatown itself. People are working together to, to make this work. But still, it's white folks still deciding what's going to happen, kind of steering this stuff. Right? Not a place of evil, but an ancient civilization. And you can see this today, like that shift. in some, There are so many great movies and TV shows and stuff that's just so awful. I say great. It, like it, it, well, you, you can even enjoy it if you don't let the racism get you down. Um, but you look at this stuff, you watch it, and you go, oh, that's, that's, that's awful. But, but I like it. Um, right, and, and there are things that we accept, and I say we, okay, I, say I did it again, I, we, I'm, I'm making you guys white guys, um, but I would say, I, I'm saying we as non-Chinese, now clearly if you're of Chinese ancestry listening to this, 
you know, flip off your computer screen or phone or whatever. I apologize. Um, but it's the idea of white folks. I'm trying to stick with that. Uh, say, so white folks, speaking as a white guy, um, watching it like Gremlins, the original Gremlins. Oh, I love that as a kid. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, don't really know if it holds up. Uh, I don't know. But the, the whole idea is with Gremlins from like 1984 or whatever, you got a guy who's like a salesman or inventor or whatever's the dad, and he's on a business trip, and he needs to buy like a birthday present or Christmas present for his kid, uh, and he, uh, he goes into a shop to, to find some cool present, right? White guy, uh, the dad, but he goes into the shop, it's owned by uh, like a Chinese guy, right? Uh, and, you know, old mysterious Chinese guy. I think it's like the kid of the Chinese guy, He's the one who actually sells him this little Kremlin thing. He's like the cute Kremlin. What is his name? Gizmo, I think. I don't. But I know what I'm gonna have to watch after I record this. Um, so yeah, it gives him the little the, the cute thing, like like a pet. You know, it's like a, a dog or a whatever. The you know for his kid, right? But the older guy is like, oh, you shouldn't have this because it's so dangerous. And of course, you know, spoiler alert, it, it makes Kremlins pop out, and it's a whole it's a whole thing. Um, but it's the idea, like, of course, of course, this thing never before seen to, you know, to anyone, uh, it, it's in the shop of a, a Chinese guy, right? If it was like some Polish immigrant, um, you, you know, they're like, uh, like, this guy would walk in and like, well, I got this gremlin, uh, you'd go like, no, no, this is fake, uh, or whatever it would be like this mind blowing thing. But no, with this movie, from what I remember, and really just with a lot of this stuff, it's like, of course, Chinese shops. If you want to find a gremlin, you're going to go into some Chinese shop in some Chinatown, right? Because that's where you're going to find it. You're not going to find it anywhere else. You're not going to find it in Little Italy. My God, no. No, because, you know, they're practically white people, right? That's the, that's the idea. So that's what's being played up here and made natural. So we've completely forgotten about as a society about the idea of Chinatown being this evil corrupt criminal awful you know place and it's more of that exciting thing right it's it's you know it's like Vegas exciting uh, at this point that's the idea so again going back to Anderson Chinatown has been an arbitrary classification of space a regionalization that has belonged to European society Right? It's white folks made this stuff up. Right? That's what they did. Okay? Uh, and and that's, that's what we're dealing with here. It's all about creating that difference, reinforcing that difference, but also it's, it's not the people who are seen as different creating it. It's those who want to make them different. I'll just, you know, close here with this last, the last little Chinatown thing I'll mention. Uh, watching the X-Files. Um, I started going back and watching some of these these older ones uh, a while ago now because uh, I liked it as a, you know, young man in the 1990s when I came out, I got into the show and I'm kind of watching some of these things and my God, I think it was like the first season. They're dealing with aliens and supernatural monsters and all sorts of crazy stuff. There's one episode that takes place in Chinatown. I think it's in San Francisco. And... Uh, there are no real monsters or aliens or anything like that. It's just the Chinese people themselves are like magical, right? In a way, it's I don't even know how to perfectly describe. I'm not going to dwell on it, uh, but it's the kind of thing where you watch it and you're like, they're just, they're just like this because they're Chinese, right? It's not because of some weird fluke like what happens to the white folks who can, you know, stretch out and and you know, go through jail bars and and stuff like that. Though those people are like, there's something. You odd about them, but like in terms of the Chinatown episode, it's kind of like, yeah, well, you know, you, you know how those people are. It, it was awful, um, but at the same time, fun episode. I, I watched it, but I felt shame. Okay, so there's Chinatown. Now, there's some other stuff in here. This whole idea of social stratification, status stuff. I'm not going to dwell on this stuff. What what this is going to lead into is, is this idea of economic. Class. I'm going to talk about class. Don't even worry about this part in here. Uh, this is fun, but we're behind on, so I'm going to skip through here. And we're going to get into Flint, Michigan. I already mentioned Flint before with you guys in one of these lectures. 
the pictures here, the the place. I, I may come back to these things here, but I'm going to stop now. But because what I want to do is I want this to lead into watching uh, Michael Moore's first documentary film, Roger and Me. And I'm going to figure, I'll get you guys the link. We'll do some kind of viewing party thing so I can play it off my computer and you guys can watch it. But you can also feel free. You don't have to watch it with me. Um, like if you just want to go to you know, whatever streaming service uh, you use and, and type in Roger and me and pay the two ninety nine for it and watch it on you. You can do that. I'm going to send out some some questions I want you guys to answer for the thing. But we're going to watch it because it's, it's a good, it's good insight into difference from an economic class standpoint. And this, this film was made in 1989. It's still relevant today like it shocks me i've seen this movie a ridiculous amount of times i first saw it in high school um and it was you know it was much newer much more relevant uh back then um but so i saw that uh then and then i, I saw it again in, in college and then i just i started showing it to students and what's amazing over the you know however long i don't even want to do the math but however long i've been watching it showing it how many times I've seen it, it's still, apart from the clothing styles and stuff, it's, it's, nothing has changed. And it's so relevant to the Antelope Valley, Southern California in general. It's relevant for you guys who are going to college to, you know, figure out your career and, and do stuff. So we're going to watch that. And it's a good movie. It's, it's funny. And there's a rabbit lady who I just... Uh, I love uh, so look for that we'll give some updates on, on how we're going to do that stuff later and and you'll see I mean these are pictures of, of Flint what it looks like pretty much looks the same this is from was it 2015 it's not even right I can't even I don't know I can't even remember when, this was during the water crisis like when it was all falling apart I was there in the spot reading the landscape taking pictures doing that kind of stuff uh, and it's just amazing how things are abandoned. And stuff has looked like this for decades. And it's an abandoned in a way we don't even see here in Southern California. Somebody loses their house, somebody quickly goes in and buys it, flips it, makes a huge profit. Not in a place like Flint. Uh, that should tell you a lot. Uh, spooky bike paths. Um, I, yeah, I showed you guys this picture. Uh, is the Evil Flint River. Let's just skip it. But here's the, oh, here's the crazy thing. That American flag. You still have homes in this place where people are patriotic. Even though the entire country has just turned, we've turned our back on these people. We've given them a big middle finger and said, you guys are on your own, figure it out. And you'll you'll see some of that as we watch the movie. Um, but yeah, it, it, people are still patriotic. That's amazing to me. And we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll do more of that. Uh, but in the meantime... There you go. We talk cigarettes. We talk racism, prostitutes. Good day, right? So there you go. Read the article if you haven't. Kay Anderson's thing. And uh, in the meantime, I don't know. Keep on keeping on or whatever. All right.